On today's episode of the McCann Dogs Podcast. Purchasing a dog because you love the look and not doing any research into the dog's temperament is just not a good idea. There are some breeds that it's their heritage to be absolutely worried. It's their heritage yeah. to be super vigilant and to react. And that's true to that breed. Yes. And no amount of love is going to change that. And now, Instructor Shannon. We are in the studio today. We have a really important topic to talk about. But I first, thought you were going to say we have a really important guest. <gasps> we Chris do. Christine. Yes. In, <laughs> in, instructor Christine Yay. is our really important guest today. <laughs> instructor Swanee, as we've all come to know and love her as. Hi, Swanee. Thanks for coming Hi, on. Hi, Shannon. Thanks for having me again. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so, Instructor Swanee and I'm Instructor Shannon. And today we wanted to talk about breed choices and specifically do you really want that breed of dog this is such an important topic because before you even get to bring your dog home you have an opportunity to make sure that the dog is going to be a really good match for your lifestyle and bringing home the wrong dog the wrong breed can can throw such a wrench into things and it can create a situation where you're frustrated before you've even gotten started with your puppy so today we wanted to talk about how to make sure you're not going that down that road and making the same mistakes that a lot of a lot of people make you know we have a lot of people that um, come in for lessons and they're extremely frustrated because they're just not quite getting through they're not quite getting the connection they're not quite making the same impact with their dog that they were expecting to and now they're in a spot where they they love the dog and they mm -hmm. want the dog but the dog's frustrated and they're frustrated and there's all sorts of things that just are not quite gelling I thought that it would be a good opportunity opportunity to sit down and chat about some of the ways that our students and our, our listeners can make sure that they're finding the right dog for them, a dog that's going to match their lifestyle, et cetera, because it is a very big, broad world out there in the dog world, but there's a lot of tools that we can use to make sure that we're getting a good dog, the right dog, a dog that's going to fit our lifestyle and a dog that we're going to end up enjoying rather right. than being frustrated with. So mm -hmm. trust us when we say that if you bring home a dog that is a mismatch breed type for you, it's probably going to cause you far more frustration than you were expecting. And it could end up in a situation where you're looking to rehome that dog or the dog is living a lifestyle that it is not necessarily built for and you're living with a dog that you're not necessarily built for. So mm -hmm. let's jump right into this. First off, what I want to um, highlight is how many different breeds you have had. Oh, so I've I've had quite a few. So as an adult, I've had um, Cardigan Welsh Corgis, Belgian Malinois, Salukis, Chinese Crested Powder Puff, mm -hmm. and a Sheltie. Yeah. Is that? That's it. Yeah. That's a whole yeah. bunch of them. Yes. And you grew and up with boxers. I grew up with boxers. And then my parents got Border Collies. Uh, when, I, when I was very little, they had a, a German Shepherd. And... Um, and I trained a, as a teenager, I trained my aunt's German short hair pointer to, uh, okay. to, uh, for competitive obedience. So yes. when you were in your early 20s, mm -hmm. what were the things that you were looking for in a dog? Well, we were, uh, my husband and I were very active in dogs mm -hmm. and I knew I wanted to do fly ball. I knew I wanted to do competitive obedience. Um, I knew the dogs were going to be a central part of my life. So I wanted dogs that were highly trainable. I wanted dogs with lots of working drive and I wanted dogs that would be, uh, you know, good for the sports that I wanted to do with them. Yeah. What kind of sports were you doing? Well, I uh, started off with competitive obedience mm -hmm. and fly ball was the other big sport. Okay. And anything else that you did with them? Eventually we got into agility okay. when um, agility was very much in its infancy and in, in, I think we were, I don't know if it even really was in Canada because the first few tournaments I went to were just over the border in the United States. So this is back in the late eighties. Okay. And, uh, and then it was just starting to come into Canada into, in the early nineties. Okay. So uh, we did get involved with uh, agility as it came along too. Nice. Mm -hmm. And you wanted dogs that would be competitive in all those sports. Right. So what were you looking for in terms of the quality of the breed? Like in terms of of intelligence and drive, et cetera. I wanted a dog that was drivey, mm -hmm. very drivey that said, you know what? I want to work no matter what. And I'm just going to go, go, go no matter what. Okay. And I wanted a dog that was, uh, that was intelligent and could do some problem solving and, and that I could hone that dog's thinking 
into my dog sports. Okay. Also, I was in my early 20s, as was my husband. My husband was an avid jogger. Uh, he wanted dogs that he could jog with. Okay. Um, we were very, we had no children and we were very active with the dogs. So uh, we were looking basically for dogs that would, you, you know, complement our lifestyle. Perfect. All right. Now, fast forward a few years. Now, I could Just mention too, yeah. we also both decided we didn't enjoy brushing dogs. So oh. we were looking for smooth coated breeds. At first, we went to see Belgian Gronendales which are uh, the same breed as a Malinois, but they have long black hair, like a Sheltie. Mm -hmm. And we got to the breeder and we you know, were you know looking at the dogs and chatting with them. And I suddenly realized that, wow, these dogs have a lot of coat. They do. And I'm just not a dog brusher and neither was Dan. <laughs> so we said, you know what? Let's look at the Malinois. They have a shorter, a shorter coat. So- Yes. And that dog brushing thing is the reason that has kept you away from one of your favorite breeds that you've always talked about. Exactly. What's that? I would love to own an Afghan hound. But you don't like brushing dogs. I just can't. And it's, it's, I know I could trim one to have mm -hmm. a shorter coat, but that's not the Afghan I love. The yeah. Afghan I love is the full show coated, beautiful, just freshly brushed Afghan hound. It's such a gorgeous creature. Right. And watching them run, oh, yes. watching the fluidity in the coat as mm -hmm. they run or move, I yes. can completely appreciate that. But I'm with you. I want to admire that from afar. I have enough toller hair all over my house and enough work to do when brushing out tollers. R yes. Yeah. Well, even once I had my Sheltie, I thought, you know what? My Sheltie only weighs, what, 13 pounds. She was a teeny one. How much and hair could they I possibly thought, have? How much brushing could yeah. that dog take? Sheltie breeders and owners, give us some comments down below about what you think about Swanee's introduction <laughs> to hoping that a 13 pound dog won't have her house covered in hair and won't be a huge uh, Right, huge. yes, yes. <laughs> 13 pound dogs will shed about on a weekly basis, I think, at least 30 pounds of hair. I don't know where that came from. So that I loved, I loved Atari to bits and I, I adored that dog. And the only thing I could fault her on was the shedding and the brushing. Cause yeah. I realized, you know what? I'm not a brusher. Yeah. Not a brusher. Yeah. Well, and, and these are good things to know about <laughs> right. ourselves yes. for sure. Yes. So then if we fast forward to nowadays, what are you looking for in terms of breed qualities now? Well, I'm older now. Mm -hmm. I'm older. Just a few I am, years. Yeah, just a few older. years. Yes. But I like peace now. <laughs> I like peacefulness. <laughs> and I like, if it's raining, I don't have to worry about exercising the dog. If it's really cold, I don't need to worry about exercising the dog. So I still love to have dogs that love to work, but I don't need the excess right. energy. I don't need that hard driving dog. I want dogs that are, you know, easy for somebody to care for if I go on a vacation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I want dogs that, um, you know, I could take places and not have to constantly be aware of the environment because, mm -hmm. you know, is, is the dog going to see a soccer ball roll by and just uh, go yeah. into that, uh, you know, that I need to get it, need to get it. So I'm looking for a more chill dog now. Gotcha. So what do you think about the prospect of bringing home a Malinois now? I, I, I adore the breed. I love the breed, but I, I don't have that kind of time anymore. Yeah. 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 And I don't have the inclination the inclination yes to be responsible you know for that dog because i want my dog to have the best life yes of course i, I you know and i thought you know what if you know malinois deserves to go into a working home where it's working yeah um you know of course it would work with me but not to the extent that i feel that breed needs yeah mm -hmm. and they are busy working dogs and the working dogs in general, any dogs that fall into the classification of a working dog, those dogs could pretty much work circles around our eight hour work day with us mm -hmm. and then still have eight more hours of work in them. So yes. this is sort of some of the... Um, some of the points that I wanted to make today, and you made that one beautifully, it, you know, depending on where you're at in your lifestyle, depending on what kind of time you have to devote to a dog, et cetera, it will drive your decision or it should rather drive your decision about what kind of dog you want to bring home into your house. And we have the benefit of predictability when it comes to getting a purebred mm -hmm. dog. There's a lot of mixes that are, are uh, very popular these days. We see 
tons and tons of doodles and uh, a doodle might be the perfect match for your lifestyle, but we want to make sure that you go into it knowing how to look for the right doodle and not just finding, you know, something that's um, a little bit more chaotic than you had expected, maybe, for example. So we're going to talk mm-hmm. all about how to find the right dog, how to ask the right questions, how to do the right research, etc. So that what by the time you get to the point where you're bringing home your new wonderful little puppy, be it a purebred dog or a doodle or any other sort of mix, you are well prepared for it and you're excited about it and you know it's going to be the right match for you and for your lifestyle. Myself, I haven't had nearly as many breeds as you have had. I started with a Rottweiler and that was our family dog and then I went into Tollers and after I went into Tollers, I just never looked back. I honestly found what I think is the perfect dog for me. I'm also... um. I'm a little hesitant about change, I think, compared to uh, a lot of people. And compared to you, you like to you like, I to, like to make to, changes. Yes, like I'm always thinking, what should my next dog breed be? <laughs> and what I, should I do yeah. next? What breed would you consider if you... Yeah, I like, I really like field training. So uh-huh. I would probably stick in the field training vein. And I think that if I went with a different breed, a Chessy. A Chesapeake oh, Bay right. Retriever yes, yes. could very well be the next dog on my list. Right. Um, I really do like a lot of the sporting dogs mm-hmm. that you see. Um, and like I said, I really like field work. So I wouldn't yes. want to have a dog that I couldn't do that activity. Right. Yes. With. I mean, you can do the activity with any dog, but in terms of like actually going to mm. tests and trials and whatnot, there's only certain breeds that you can compete with right. um, in CKC, at least and in AKC. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are other organizations that you can compete with mixed breeds in mm. and all sorts of things when it comes to field work right. but specifically with CKC you have to have one of these specific breeds in order to compete in right. height yeah. tests etc. Yeah. Well, that so. makes complete sense yeah you have to know yeah. what you're what what you want to do with the dog yeah um, yes yes exactly yes, so that's one of my driving forces right. it would keep me in the sporting vein uh, sporting dog challenge mm-hmm. um, or channel rather right. so on that um, on that note, there are 187 CKC recognized breeds at this point. Wow! So yeah, that's incredible. That's, a lot. Eh? that's yes. up from 185 yes. a couple of years ago, and uh, new breeds tend to be added all the time. And I do suspect that doodles at some point soon, mm-hmm. be they labradoodles or golden doodles, will end up being recognized. Uh, that's a very controversial topic, mm-hmm. and and you know hopefully it's uh, it's something that is well thought out Mm -hmm. and it is on the uh, agenda of some people who are working to create, you know, a true doodle type breed and a true, um, a bred true vein Mm -hmm. to make sure that you can start to predict the qualities of those breeds. Mm -hmm. Actually, just before we go on, uh, uh, people who are listening, if you want to put in the comments, a breed you would love to own, but no, it's not for oh, you. Oh, that's a good like, one. Like my, with my Afghan hound. So yeah, put in the comments, please. We'd like to see We'd breeds that hear, you go, yeah. oh, I'd love it, but I just know deep down it's not the one for me. Yeah. Yes. And then tell us too what your dream breed that you know will fit best right? into yes. your lifestyle Oh, for sure. Will yes. Be. yes. Yeah. Yes. So when it comes to our purebred dogs that are recognized already. The Mm -hmm. benefit of these recognized breeds is that they have well-established traits about them, be Mm -hmm. they the appearance of the dog or the type of the dog, be they the temperament of the dog, the health expectations of the dog, etc. There's all these predictable factors that we can rely on. So for example, I know in tollers that I'm going to get, if I get my male tollers, as I usually do, Mm -hmm. I'm going to get a goofy dog that's got lots of energy and drive and and decent work ethic, and I'm going to be able to do all sorts of things with that dog Mm -hmm. and you know I I can even split it down into going with certain breeders because they have more strength in their lines for this activity or that activity Mm -hmm. etc so and you know the size you're going to get too yes you bet you're not going to get a big surprise and get an 80 pound toller (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Although I almost did with Ned. It's so funny because I had Tyler and Reggie who were the tiny little, tiniest little tollers. And the toller standard says that they can be 19 to 20 or 19 to 20 inches, give or take an inch. Mm-hmm. So I had Tyler and Reggie who were 18 inches. So just the bottom end of the mm-hmm. standard. And then I got Ned home and he topped out at 21 inches. So I have lived with the extreme ends mm-hmm. and uh, it's been very interesting. They've been, they've been fairly different in terms of personality, but there's a lot of very similar similarities. So that predictability factor is there for sure. 
like you said, the the appearance, the size of the breed, mm -hmm. the coat, right? Type. You know what you're getting into. Yes, absolutely. Which that is something. And I, that, I know the stroller coat too because I see it on Shannon's clothes sometimes. <laughs> yes. And then when she rides in my car, yes. she takes it to her house on her clothes. <laughs> it's a force. It's an absolute force. There's no getting around it. I actually just um, just brushed out Reggie, who turned 15 in uh, in May. April. We're in May right now. He turned 15 in April and the amount of coat that comes out of that dog, he got neutered at 10 due to a health issue. Uh, generally, if you keep them intact, there's not nearly as much explosion in coat, although Ned has tons and tons of undercoat that comes out all the time. So there's exceptions to every rule. Mm -hmm. But Reggie was a pretty easy to maintain dog right up until he got neutered and then his coat exploded. And now it's like I create a whole other dog every spring when he starts to have his spring blowout and he tends to shed all year long now now that he's neutered as well you should save the fur and knit it into scarves and hats Actually, and yeah it's funny there was a woman in the toller community when i had Jaden, like way back mm -hmm. when uh that would weave toller hair so i would save Jaden's hair and send it <laughs> off to her but i've lost touch with her since and jaden has been gone for a long somewhere time somewhere so. in the world somebody is wearing a, a Jaden leisure suit she made him into a leisure suit. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it would be the most beautiful leisure suit you had ever seen in your life. It oh would. my goodness. So, okay. So back on track a little bit, although I do enjoy getting off track. Another nice thing about purebred dogs is they're a piece of living history. Oh, yes. So they are our heritage. Yes. And they're, they're yeah, many of our breeds are historic. Yes. And they, they go back you know, a thousand years or hundreds and hundreds of years. And I, I like that, that yeah. they, they're historic, they're history. Absolutely. And actually, I'm really glad you brought that up because I want to dive down that um, that rabbit hole for a second, because this is one of the things that is very confused in the dog world is what is a good breeder versus what is a breeder that you want to avoid. Um, there are, the, this, this term breeder has sort of been applied en masse to anybody who produces dogs. Mm -hmm. And and I think that there needs to be some differentiation. There's a very, very big difference worlds apart between what we would call a puppy mill and what we would call a heritage breeder. You use right. that word heritage, which mm -hmm. that is what uh, good breeders that have been breeding for a long time and raise puppies in home and have their puppy rearing down to a fine art and a wonderful science. Right. And they can recite the generation, like seven generations Absolutely. back, just like that. They can tell yeah. you that puppy's great, 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 great yes. aunt. Like, yes, yeah, yes. they're like walking encyclopedias right. for their dogs. They know yes. exactly what they're looking for to breed this dog to this dog and what they're hoping to improve mm -hmm. on with each generation. Right. They try to improve yes. the breed. And that is a huge factor. Yes. Huge, huge difference between somebody that is just, you know, maybe a backyard breeder or a puppy mill mm -hmm. versus a heritage breeder. A heritage breeder's goal is to improve upon the breed. Each generation should get better and better and better. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not unheard of at all that a heritage breeder would say, you know what? I grew this puppy up a little bit and I don't like how he turned out. So I'm going to place him in a home. Mm -hmm. So, and that is a good thing. Mm -hmm. We want people who are very discerning when it comes to right. putting together our purebred dogs, mm -hmm. because they are the ones that are caretaking for the breed. Yes. And they're the ones that make, that are making sure that a German shepherd stays true to type and they're considering temperament and they're considering health and all of the things that we sort of would take for granted right. by just, you know, going mm -hmm. and paying for a puppy and bringing home a puppy is is the, the idea that all of these things coming together will ensure that 12 years down the road or 15 years down the road, mm -hmm. I have a healthy senior at home right. right now. All of my tollers have been fairly long lived. Uh, my Rottweiler sadly was only 10 when she passed. It's it's a reasonable life mm -hmm. for a Rottweiler. Um, they have a shorter life expectancy, of course. So those are the things that are so important as well right. when we're thinking about bringing another family member into our home right. is making sure that we're going to still be able to have healthy companions when they're 13 and 14 and 15 years old and they're not running into all sorts of health problems right. midway through life. There are certain health problems that we know are connected with certain breeds mm -hmm. and one of the things that heritage breeders do is they make sure that they do health testing. Yes. So for example, in tollers, there's a laundry list as long as my arm of specific um, illnesses and, and things that will be tested for when it comes to heart and eyes and hips and elbows and, you know, all sorts of things to make mm. sure that the dogs that are being bred are the right dogs and right. they're going to pass on the right genes. Mm -hmm. And then that evaluation of those puppies going forward as well 
gives the breeder back excellent information of mm-hmm. what they're going to continue breeding in the future. So right. all these really important factors that come along with going to a heritage breeder mm-hmm. versus, you know, mm-hmm. any of the other type of dog production that would happen out there like the puppy mills and backyard bred dogs as well this is sort of a this is a big category what do you Mm -hmm. think how would you describe backyard bred dogs a backyard bred dog is someone who hasn't put the thought into it they they basically say you know what we really like our dog and we think she'd have good puppies Mm -hmm. but they haven't they they haven't done the health testing yeah they haven't uh, they pick a male not looking at bloodlines they don't understand bloodlines right they're probably not in a position to take the puppy back if uh you know a year down the road something happens and you can no longer keep the puppy they're going to probably say no we have no interest in having that dog back yeah Um, that's your dog you bought it right yeah yeah and that's a difference with a heritage breeder as well Mm -hmm. every single one of my dogs that I have purchased Mm -hmm. has come with a very clear stipulation and I don't think this is limited to the Toller community I think that this is as well responsible breeders will always want those dogs back so regardless what happens you know if suddenly two years from now I am diagnosed with cancer and I can no longer care for my dogs I have plans in place for them Mm -hmm. so that they have good places to go but I know that if those plans fell through I would always be able to rely on giving them back to the breeder for the breeder to be able to then go forward with assessing how to rehome that dog so I know my dogs are never ending up in shelters and that is a really important thing to me because because I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. You yes. know, we could all get hit. All of us all at of the us. same time the could same get time. hit by yep. a bus. Right? Yeah, that's a big bus. Yeah, but <laughs> sometimes we get but, a little ridiculous. Yes, yes, but truly, we do the same thing with our kids, right? We have godparents mm-hmm. in place. We have a, right. I, I assume that like this is something mm-hmm. that's probably weighed heavily right. on your mind until now. Now yeah. Ty is pretty uh, able yeah. to take care of himself at this point yes. as a young twenty-year-old man. 20, right? Twenty-one. He's twenty. He's still 20. I still can't believe you have a 20 year old son now. I can't at this point. either. And he's, yeah, he's capable of looking after himself. Yeah. Except I for making he... dentist appointments. He'll ask his mom to make his <laughs> dentist appointments still. That's going to happen when he's 52. Yeah. You better still be around or he won't have good He'll, teeth. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness. That's funny. But yeah, the, like these are important things. I want to make sure that my dogs are always, they always have a place to go. You know, like sometimes people will write their dogs into their will. And, right? and yeah. I think that's an amazing thing to mm-hmm. prepare for the, um, possibility that you need to send your dog to somebody else and to make sure that financially anything they could ever need is covered there. It, like that's such a responsible and wonderful thing to do. Like that right. truly is love mm-hmm. in, yes. in my opinion. That is you loving your animal and making sure that they will always be safe even if you're not around anymore. Right. That's fabulous. Yes. And, and you hear of breeders too, heritage breeders, who they know something has happened to one of their dogs and they reach out to the community yes. and say, you know, my, you know, this dog was in a home something has happened we know the dog's been placed does anyone know where this dog is yeah and they're and they're frantic to find out what has happened even though it's a puppy they produced eight years ago uh we had that in our in the saluki world um some some um, things that happened and a breeder from sweden had sent a puppy over here and the dog i think was probably about 11 or 12 at the point where she lost connection and didn't know where the puppy was and adult dog the dog ended up um at the humane society and the humane society right away said you, you don't see this breed here uh, and one of our you know contact the saluki club one of my saluki friends took the dog and uh, they were able to track down the original breeder in sweden who had been looking for this dog oh my gosh amazing so it was you know so even that much time later that that heritage breeder was still very much in tune like where's my puppy yeah yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Amazing. Mm-hmm. And the toller communities like that as well. We're starting to, starting to see, unfortunately, more tollers show up in rescues and shelters. And we've had toller rescue organizations in place for a very long time, both U.S. and Canada. I'm sure Europe does as well, but I don't follow the community in Europe quite as closely as I do in North America. And I am so confident in the people that do the work in rescue to make sure that that dog is not only, you know, not only brought into the toller fold, but also 
the breeders are contacted and, and there's a, a real attempt to try to have the entire community help right. with this dog and making sure that if the, if there is a dog in rescue that is a toller that needs to be rehomed, it only ever happens once, yes. right? If, if they get involved and make sure that the second home is very well vetted, very appropriate for a toller, mm-hmm. et cetera, that hopefully that dog will end up living the rest of its life in pure luxury and breeders are often stepping in to help mm-hmm. with that, even if it's not one of their own dogs. Right, yes. Dog breed registration is governed geographically. Please check your local dog registry for more information on the breeds that you're looking into. Happy training. Yes. So that brings me to another point about um, going with a heritage breeder versus, you know, just finding something right. out there mm-hmm. um, is that you have an incredible source of information right off the get go. So say, for example, you decide that you are interested in uh Let's say a peer shep pup, a Berger okay. to Pyrenees, mm-hmm. um, because that's a little bit of a rare breed. That is, so there's yes. not as much information mm-hmm. out there about the breed and you want to know more about them. Breeders are an excellent source of information. So mm-hmm. reaching out to a breeder to ask mm-hmm. them about the temperament of the dogs and what you should expect and what yes. it's like to live with this dog and going out and visiting. Right. Yes. Etc. Like yes. those are such important steps and stages to be able to do. And to clarify, we're talking about purebreds, but if you are looking for a doodle, you should have the exact same mm-hmm. ability. Like there are people out there who are trying to breed um, better lines of doodles and breeding um, mm-hmm. doodles and, true yep, to do, type. And so, doing all the health checks yeah. and really, you know, being diligent with their puppies. You should be able to tap into that breeder mm-hmm. for good information and good understanding of what you're going to be able to live with. Right. So yes. And they should be able to predict the dog's coat, hopefully. Yes. Um, Cause you get all kinds of different coats with a doodle. Yes, you yes. do. It's actually quite the fallacy that doodles are hypoallergenic. You can get a mix of all sorts of different things in there. So the coat might be a little bit milder in terms of its production of dander, or it might be producing a, a, a less mm-hmm. offensive type of dander, right. but there is often still an right. allergic factor there. Yes. So, and often it's the saliva too, that people are allergic you're to. Right. Absolutely. I have read that. So where else would you go for breed information? So you've talked to a couple of breeders. Where else might you go if you're looking for peer shep information? Well, I would uh, possibly definitely go to a dog show. Okay. And and that's probably the first thing I do is sit and watch them at a dog show. Yeah, that's a great idea. I'm not just watching them in the ring. I'm going to watch when the breeder is waiting to go in the ring, when the breeder's walking away from the ring. How does that dog act? Yeah, I love that. So what are you looking for in those moments? Well, in those moments, I'm looking for, so I can see the dog's basic reactions to different stimuli. Excellent. And if I see the dog's got its tail tucked between its leg or it's fearful or the breeder's holding its muzzle shut as she walks through a busy area, I might go... Oh, that's yeah. maybe not how I want to walk through the fairgrounds with my dog or, yeah. or sit at my son's soccer game with my dog. So I'm looking for a dog that, you know, is very gregarious and yes. takes in. That's a good word. I love the word yeah, gregarious. Yeah, just, you know, takes everything in stride. Yeah. Um, if I see any temperament extremes, I'm going to question, is that the breed for me? Yes. Because there are some breeds that are, it's their heritage to be absolutely worried it's their heritage yeah. to be super vigilant and to react and that's true to that breed yes and no amount of love is going to change that yeah that's the breed's genetics absolutely the the toller standard actually describes them as aloof which is one of the things that attracted me to them mm-hmm. um labs and goldens are lovely wonderful dogs but at the end of the day, they're not the right breed for me because I like a dog that's a little bit more singularly focused when it comes to humans. Mm -hmm. And my tollers have always loved me and I love quote unquote love. Mm -hmm. My tollers have always been very loyal Loyal, to me and have always been very loyal to my family. But in terms of being everybody's best friend, the toller is not that breed. So if I tried to walk Ned away from you, he would be turning back saying he like, would. no, no, yeah. That's, yeah, I need to be with Shannon. Absolutely. Right. And where Ned would come up, he has a fabulous temperament. He's very unflappable and he's a very friendly mm-hmm. dog, but where he would come up to you and say, Hey, how's it going? 
and then you would say, oh, I'm good. How are you? It's nice right. to meet you. And then yeah. he'd go see you. And right. he'd come back to see what I was up to or right. look for something interesting on the ground. Uh -huh. Whereas a golden or a lab would come up to you and go, hey, how's it going? I love right. you. I love you. I love you. You're right. my new yes. best friend. Oh my gosh. I right. love you so much. Can I go home with you? Yep. And then I would be sitting watching that and my ego would be getting damaged. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, truly. Right. I can handle it. Yeah. But, but that's what makes goldens and labs such good dogs. Absolutely. They are popular for a reason. And the overwhelming majority of people love that about them. Right. They want the dog that's all wiggles and sunshine and love to right. everyone yes. and everything. And hey, more power to you. This is what this episode is all about. Mm -hmm. It's about recognizing our individuality and yep. recognizing what dog is going to fit best into our lifestyle. Right. Yes. Where yes. something like that would feel, for lack of a better word, annoying to me. Everybody, or not everybody else, but lots of other people, and there's there's a reason that Labs and Goldens are at the top of the list right, in yes. terms of popularity. But especially if you have a family and you have a lot of kids coming over to play yes. with your kids. Uh, you love having backyard barbecues with your friends. Um, yeah. If you're a very a person who does a lot of entertaining, mm -hmm. those are perfect breeds. Yes. Like a bad breed would be like a Great Pyrenees. Yes. Uh, they're bred as a guardian breed for yes. generations. They've been bred to guard their yes, homestead. Absolutely. So, and be defensive and suspicious. Right. Yeah. So overwhelming them with guests goes completely against what yes. that breed is about. Yeah. Now, of course, you know, there's exceptions to every rule, but yeah, like you can't beat a golden or a lab for saying, yeah, come on over neighbors, yes. come on yeah. over, I'll, I'll grab you a beer out of the fridge. Absolutely. And another thing to think about in that vein is how is the dog in terms of resilience? And physical resilience is a big deal when you have kids in the home right. because yes. kids are rough and tumble. And even mm -hmm. when you have done, we have a kids and dogs episode, you know, if you're looking mm -hmm. for some tips on how to raise kids and dogs together, you can absolutely get into that episode. And I think it will really be helpful. You had some amazing ideas oh, and some things you. that you did with, you're welcome, some things that you did with Ty when he was young to make sure that uh, everything was copacetic right. and like having a breed like a Saluki, who's probably probably a little bit more delicate that that was really important mm -hmm. to be able to do that. Some of our dogs are much more resilient when it comes to physical stuff. So right. in a, in a busy household mm -hmm. with a lot of kids running around, if you know, they get knocked over or, right. or the soccer, dog gets a knocked soccer over, ball a soccer ball hits, hits them. them. Or, yeah. Yes. Or, you know, the kids are running around with inflatable baseball bats that are, you know, air <laughs> baseball bats right. and smacking each other yeah. with those and they smack the dog. The dog's not going to be completely panicked. Yeah. And traumatized. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So breeds or, like or a leg broken if you have a, a frail breed like an italian yeah, greyhound or a, maybe a very tiny miniature pincer yeah those breeds aren't bred for rough housing with children at no all. you're right absolutely you need to look for a sturdy little thing yeah. yes <laughs> sturdy little thing i immediately went to like a mini bull terrier and yeah <laughs> that's a sturdy little thing <laughs> yes yeah or a, a sturdy golden or a sturdy lab. yes yeah absolutely and these dogs are bred to go into icy water so their pain tolerance is very high so they're mm -hmm. not likely to overreact they're right. not likely to be overly worried they're mm -hmm. very as you said gregarious so very mm -hmm. friendly and very outgoing and want to be part of things and you know like that's a great family dog is, and if you yes. have lots of activity activity and energy going on. It should go without saying, of course, that all interactions with kids and dogs should be heavily supervised mm -hmm. by a capable adult. Right. But uh, we know that even in those situations, things happen. Yes. You know, I was at a birthday party recently with uh, seven kids running and having fun and some of them are outgrowing the kid status, but mm -hmm. it gets wild. Right. Like, yeah. Kids can be the adrenaline high and yep. the sugar rush. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we want to make sure that our dogs fit into that well right. so yes. that they can be part of our lifestyle. So, right. yes. Um, yeah, because some breeds are more apt to run and nip at kids. Yes. Um, you know, some of the herding breeds, that's their heritage to control movement. Yes. So suddenly there's this frantic movement and the dog goes into its genetics. Yes, absolutely. The, the, the genetic makeup comes out and the dog says, you know what? I have to control this movement. I'm going to chase. I'm going to nip. I'm going to pull at the kid clothing and it's not the dogs being bad it's it's pulling from yeah. its genetic genetic heritage absolutely and this is another thing that i think is a really nice predictability factor when it comes to going with a dog that has been bred true that is a purebred dog that you know what to expect in a lot of these scenarios so you've got the idea that this dog is going to be great with my family this dog is not necessarily going to be as good as a family at a, as a family pet this dog is going to love coming to the cottage with us and go going swimming, swimming with yes, us yes. this dog is going to fit well into our lifestyle, et cetera. So with that predictability factor, 
how do we find out, first of all, and I'm thinking about groups um, in CKC, how do we find out what sort of the overarching idea with that breed is? First thing is is reading up on what the breed is bred to do. Mm -hmm. And how would people find that information? Well, you can definitely do some research. Uh, Mm -hmm. Google tells you lots. Uh, Go to the library, look up, you know, Get out some books for summer reading. Remember all the old dog encyclopedias? Right, yeah. When I first started in dogs, right. I had a stack of them and I would study them because yes. I was just fascinated and so completely enamored with mm-hmm. the dog the dog stuff, right. all of it. Yes. I wanted to know as much as I could. So yes. yeah. Yeah. And talking to other people who own the breed. Yeah. So I, I remember um I, I always loved the Belgian Granadale growing up. And uh, growing up in a dog show family, I saw them all the time and um, I would watch them and I would chit chat with the people who owned them. And, you know, I thought, oh, yes, this is the breed I want. And then I realized I, I did a reality check when I realized the brushing, like when I was yeah. actually going to get one. It's like that. That's a lot of fur, a lot of fur. It is. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Talk to people, you know, think about that dog in your everyday life. Mm -hmm. How much room is it going to take up in the car? Yes. Um, How much food is it going to eat? Veterinary bills are usually higher for bigger dogs because they require more medication. Absolutely. Even even more anesthetic. Your your flea and tick medication is, it's a lot more pricey. Yes. Think about if that dog throws up, how much is going to come out? (laughs) Honda threw up the other night and it was just this cute little puddle of throw up. But if that had been a great big Great Dane, it would have been a a lake of throw up. It wouldn't have been a cute little puddle. No, it wouldn't have been cute. (laughs) (laughs) So think about that too. Um, I saw a bloodhound have diarrhea once and I I have never seen so much come out of an animal other than an ostrich. I went to the African lion safari and an ostrich went to the bathroom and it was like someone threw a paint can, a (laughs) white paint can. (laughs) I highly recommend it. Actually, it was like a yeah, we'll have to talk to Jan about that. Right, we yeah. had instru- we had instructor Jan on the podcast yes. to talk about spay neuter, and we talked a little bit about ostriches because she has a lot of history in ostriches. Right. Yes. <laughs> Another funny. thing, I used to work at an emergency veterinary hospital, mm-hmm. and we would sometimes at midnight get a phone call, and it's somebody with a large mastiff breed, and the dog is is flat. They have to get it in, oh. but they can't lift it. It's too heavy. And, you know, they say, is there a dog ambulance? And I'm oh, like, no, goodness. I'm sorry. You're going to have to knock on a neighbor's door yeah. or call a family member to get that dog to the animal hospital. So, you know, and I heard Carol talking the other day that Fred, her pig, had injured himself once in the forest. And it was, she was about four kilometers in. And she says, I couldn't carry him. He oh, was too goodness. heavy. She goes, he was forced to have to walk. Oh, So, you know, think of that too. Yeah. I think sometimes... You know, sure. a portable dog sometimes, you know, has its benefits. Yeah, you are absolutely right. That's a really good point. Um, this would probably be a good point for everybody to Google how to make a dog harness and how to safely carry your dog right. if you have one. Mm-hmm. I also, with my Rottweiler, I got really good advice when she was young from probably from our Puppy Essentials program, um, but I can't remember specifically where it came from. But the really good advice was mm-hmm. to teach her to be comfortable with two people carrying her at the same oh, time. Good advice, So yes. that like one person in the front end, one person in the back end, and she was not a huge Rottweiler. Mm-hmm. Her like fighting weight when she was really, really fit was 76 pounds. Um, so she was, she was well within standard for a mm-hmm. female. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of breeding for size sometimes with Rottweilers mm-hmm. that uh, it typically is outside of the heritage breeder factor. Why do people factor. think bigger is better? I don't know. It's just more impressive, I guess, on some level for certain people. But mm-hmm. yeah, they're supposed to be athletic dogs. So it always makes me sad when I see one that's, you know, clumbering along. And, right. Yeah. They seem to be lazier, don't yeah, they? Yeah. It doesn't really have the athleticism behind it. Uh, but regardless, right, that was, yes. um, that's an aside. But mm-hmm. I, I thought that was really good advice having to get her accustomed to so right. that if ever she was hurt, yep. I could carry her whatever distance I needed to with another person helping, of course, because me carrying a nearly 80 pound dog over a long distance right. by yes. myself is probably not mm-hmm. going to go over very well. So those are, those right. are really good things to be able to, um, to be able to plan for. Yes. Yeah. I think a lot of people purchase a dog on appearance. Yes. They say, I love how this dog looks. And if it's a rare breed, rare breeds are often rare for a reason. Yes. There's something about them that just doesn't fit into our family pet and it requires a special person to care for them. Yeah. So, you know, purchasing a dog because you love the look and not doing any research 
into the dog's uh, temperament uh, mm-hmm. is just not a good idea. Yeah, we are actually seeing, um, we're seeing a lot of mismatches recently with Aussies yes. as a breed. Yes. Because they're beautiful dogs. They they're are. Absolutely gorgeous and their, dogs. Their colors are beautiful yes. too. I think yeah. that's what really attracts people to them is those merles are, are gorgeous. I think you're right. And you see this beautiful, puffy looking, wonderful herding dog, right. and you're expecting to bring it home and, you know, have a couch potato through the week while you're at work and then be able to have a weekend warrior type situation Mm -hmm. and an Aussie or a Malinois or you know a border collie insert border collie insert your working dog here that dog is going to be very unhappy if they are expected to be you know ornamental through the Mm -hmm. week and then come down off the fireplace mantle on the weekends to have lots of fun and activity and that is going to end up with a frustrated dog which is going to create a frustrated owner Mm -hmm. and the the energy level of some of these dogs, it's truly hard to express what it's like to live with a working dog until you have lived with a working dog. And then you're like, oh, that's what everybody was talking about. They truly have, you have to teach an off switch. Mm -hmm. You know, with most of our working dogs, it's it's not an automatic that they're gonna have this off switch downtime. We have to work on building it. We use crates, we use Mm -hmm. bed stays, we use all sorts of things to teach the dog to be able to relax when the situation warrants. Um, Most dogs will start to self-regulate and conserve energy as they get a little bit older in their life, but that's not always the case. And that's never gonna be the case with a dog that has frustrating levels of pent up energy. Well, if you think of a breed such as an Australian cattle dog Mm -hmm. or um, people call them healers sometimes. If they're in their country of Australia and they are working sheep over like thousands and thousands of acres and they do it all day. Yeah. Sometimes at night they're up still working. Oh yeah. And it doesn't matter the weather and it doesn't matter the heat and it doesn't matter the cold. Right. And now you have one in your apartment with you. Yes. And that dog's wants to do stuff. It's like if if I if I went to the gym every single day and that was my I just loved it. I just loved it. And then one day someone says, "No, you're living with me now. Go sit on my couch and maybe on the weekend I'll get to you and give you some exercise." Yeah. Like that would be it No, would I don't be. go to the gym. But if I love <laughs> to go to the gym, that would be horrific. You could have pretended. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah. It's like a lot of us, we have our hobbies. Imagine if like gardening or something like that. Yes. And imagine if somebody suddenly said, no, no more gardening for you. You sit on the couch. You can garden for an hour on the weekend. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like it's absolutely that's what we're doing to these working breeds. Yeah. It wouldn't go over well. And these, these working breeds going for a walk around the block because you've been at mm-hmm. work all day and that's all you can give them in terms of the energy that you have left at the end of the day, going for a walk around the block or even just a neighborhood walk is not enough. Right. It's not going to be enough for no. that dog. And you, you really want to be prepared with our busy working dogs for the idea that they're ready to go at a moment's notice. And that moment's notice can be several hours for them. You know, like Like, they will go and go and go and go and go. And they're not going to be satisfied with just a little bit of exercise through the week. They're not going to be satisfied as weekend warriors. You know, even if you get out for hours and hours and hours on the weekend, Mm -hmm. it's not going to balance out through the week and they can be destructive and they can be frustrated. And, you know, they come up with their own games. They start making their own games up that, you know, often aren't good games. Yeah, absolutely. There's all of this movement now towards enrichment activities, which it's a necessity because people are getting dogs that they don't necessarily have the um, desire to work with right. their with mm-hmm. these dogs. You know, if they're picking based on appearance and they bring home an Aussie because they love how beautiful Aussies are. Mm-hmm. And I can completely understand that. Yes. But then the Aussie is frustrated and they're being destructive in the home. Now there's all these enrichment activities to bring in that, uh, you know, things like daycare and things like mm-hmm. snuffle mats and things that kind of, they, they take the edge off the dog. They do, but they make training and bonding with you become secondary. And I always talk about enrichments from column A being good enrichments that include you. Things like trick training, things like training. Mm -hmm. I would say training is the original enrichment activity and the best enrichment activity because not only does it enrich the dog, but it also enriches your relationship with your dog. So that is going to help. And I would say in the absence of these enrichments from column Mm -hmm. A, you can certainly turn to enrichments from column B on a limited basis but I consider those to be like the video games, right? Mm -hmm. Where yes, sometimes 
sometimes we want to put our kids in front of the TV and in front of the video game right. and just go, you know what? Okay, have some fun. I need to sit down and read right. a book or I need to clear my head or I need to deal with work. Right. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I'm, I'm I running need, a household and right. yeah. trying I gotta to do my budget. I yeah. got to do these things. Yes, absolutely. So we can use those things occasionally to help take the edge off. But for the most part, if we use those things exclusively and if we continue to look for more and more engaging activities that don't include us, we end up creating a dog that is very self-centered, they're self-fulfilling, and we're over here on the sidelines trying to get their attention and teach them obedience. And really, right. they don't have a lot of need for us no, at that point no. because their emotional and physical needs have been met by the daycare all day. By daycare or dog parks. So, and, yeah, yeah and absolutely. They, yeah. Yeah. So these things that are starting to be central in our dog world mm -hmm. are out of necessity because it's staving off the frustration, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So it's sort of this like big tumbleweed effect. Right. Yes. And while those enrichments can certainly help to take the edge off and help satisfy the dog, mm -hmm. I think that you really want to look at why you got a dog to begin with. Did mm -hmm. you get a dog so that you could just continue to try to meet their needs in this frantic sort of way? Or did you get a dog because you wanted a buddy? Right. You wanted somebody to hang yes. out with. And there are lots of dogs out there that would fit into the lifestyle right? yes. of ha being happy to go for the walk around the block yeah. and then be a weekend warrior. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right, no. And even our smallest dogs can be very athletic. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Like, um, Honda, when he was younger, he could hike for hours yeah. and hours and hours. And if he did get tired, I could just pick him up because he was little. But uh, yeah, don't underestimate small dogs' athletic ability. Yes. They, they can go, go, go. You don't need a big Weimaraner to you know, go on a two hour hike. It's true. Yeah, absolutely. Like a, a chihuahua could keep up with you on that. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So look at um, uh, the, the purebreds in CKC and AKC are divided into groups. So look at the groups. There's some that are called non-sporting. There's some that are called sporting. There's some that are called working. They're all bred for different things and that'll be a good jumping off right. point. So and that'll- Some breeds are bred to be companions. Yeah. Like Absolutely. They have no other use but to be a companion. No other use. That's maybe not the right way to put it, but that's what they've been bred yeah. for. They weren't bred for a working purpose. Right. Well, and like a pug. A pug's yeah. been bred to be a pet. Yeah. I've mm -hmm. had a CKC Spaniel in my home for right. a period of time before. And that dog, all that dog wanted to do was sit and snuggle. Mm -hmm. That dog's whole purpose in life was, I want to be with you. I want to be on your lap. I want to be loved by you. And right. then anybody that came in, I want to be with you. I want to love you. Yep. I want to be on your lap. Right. And but like, yet quite athletic. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. He, he, like not yes athletic no. like a... Yeah. Yeah. But you know, that dog could easily go on hikes with you and... He could. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He would have kept up with that. Yeah. But it wasn't his be all and end all right like he could have taken or left that mm -hmm. in a heartbeat and this is why i actually was um i was putting some work into him and then finding mm -hmm. him a, a home right and i knew right away like this is not a breed that would match my lifestyle because he was not into the work right you know like yeah he was happy to go for walks mm -hmm. but he was never into the training thing i mean he would he enjoyed it because he enjoyed me as a person right, yeah. but when it came to actually learning etc and the mental stimulation thing mm -hmm. his goal was just to come and sidle up to me and get snuggles and love right. and that was great it made training easy mm -hmm. in a lot of respects because mm -hmm. i could just dish out some you know lots of praise and right, lots of yeah. touching and he'd be thrilled and happy but in terms of wanting to do repetitive drills to get into the obedience ring or, you know, any of the things that I would want to do with my dogs. Mm -hmm. He wasn't into it. Right. It wasn't rewarding for yes. him on an innate level at mm -hmm. all. So uh, I think that's important to think about as well. What do you want to do with your dog? If you want to do high end dog sports, if you want to spend time training ad nauseum all week long, like a lot mm -hmm. of us do, uh, you're probably not going to want to get one of the little lap Right. dogs yes. that are out there but maybe that fits your lifestyle beautifully if mm -hmm. you want to do some really light training so you have good obedience skills right. with yeah. the dog and then just have a companion yes you know somebody to hang out with on the couch or throw balls for in the house or you know play with in the backyard right. and they're going to be satisfied with that mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with that nope. there's nothing wrong nothing. with no that's anybody having a different lifestyle there's absolutely nothing wrong with right. that but you want to get a dog that matches that lifestyle yes. so that you're not feeling the frustration Another thing that we see sometimes is people who are up in age mm -hmm. and I'm going to say just, you know, I've always had a German Shepherd, always, all my life. And now I'm 76 Ooh, yeah. and I have a German Shepherd puppy. And I, it, we just see a lot of mismatches in that way yes. too. I, I think, 
you know, I hate to say it, but when you get to a certain age, you have to really think about the breed that you're getting. Yes. Yes. And just Absolutely. because you've had them, like I, I had Malinois when I was younger, but I just don't have the the oomph anymore. Yeah. Or, or the back to be doing a ton of, ton of training with that dog. Yeah. So I know to get something, you know, you know, I'm going to choose another breed that's more more, more, a little bit more sedate now. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the, the German Shepherd may still be the right match for your lifestyle, right. but ask yourself honestly if you want to deal with all of the things that a German Shepherd puppy would bring along with it. And the and exercise and, and absolutely. Yeah. And are you prepared for the training and, you know, the physicality of the training with right. some of our dogs that grow pretty big pretty quickly? Things like that are really important to consider as well. You know, just like we wouldn't recommend trying to have a nine year old child, for example handle a big great right. dane mm -hmm. that's probably not going to go over as well as you'd like it to like there are, are definitely physical things that you need to look for as well right. yes so. are you considering bringing a new puppy home head on over to mccanndogs.com and sign up for our puppy prep guide this program covers picking the right breed daily puppy schedules that work puppy proofing your home and so much more happy training the health testing thing, I want to just touch on it a little bit more because I think that it is such an important piece mm -hmm. of the entire puzzle. And breed clubs will be a great source of information for mm -hmm. what health tests are being done with what breeds. Right. So that'll be a good um, jumping off point. And then when you go to visit breeders, don't hesitate to ask these questions. Yes. You and know, a good breeder will actually bring them out and show them to you. Absolutely. Because anyone can say, oh yeah, we checked the dog's hips a few years ago, yeah. but actually ask to see it. Yes, and there are public registries that you can tap into as well. OFA um, publishes results mm -hmm. on their website, so you can go and have a look at the dog's health tests, et cetera, and what's been passed, what grades have happened. Um, you can look into the organizations in your area and how they track health testing, because there are governing bodies for mm -hmm. this. So you can can tell for certain you can talk to people who have had puppies from those breeders you can you know some of some of the breeders that I've worked with have had 40 and 50 years worth of experience like when I first got Jaden the breeder that I got him from had been breeding tollers already in Canada for something like 30 years and that was at a point where tollers were incredibly rare so it was phenomenal to tap into her knowledge and understanding. And the first time I went out to visit and I met some of her dogs and she talked about grooming and she, you know, welcomed me in and was just wonderful and giving me all sorts of great information about the dogs. And I learned so much and I got to sort of think, okay, I think this breed really is right for me because I was actually whittling down a small list. Mm -hmm. I had a bunch of other dogs on the list that I thought, I kind of like this breed. I'm not sure if that's the breed I want. Right. I knew I wanted to, I wanted something other than mm -hmm. my Rottweiler that I had at the time. But I wasn't quite sure what at the time. Right. And of course, there was a big draw to Border Collies uh -huh. with there being so many Border Collies around, around me that were so yes. wonderful and so intelligent. Mm -hmm. But they didn't quite fit 100 percent. And at that point, I was still a little bit worried about having too, too much energy join my household. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if I was ready for that yet. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I think I'd be totally fine with it. Uh, but at that time, I was like, maybe just a little bit lower key. And tollers were a little bit lower key. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of farm collie in their heritage. So there is a lot of similarities. Mm -hmm. And there's some definite herding behaviors that I've right. seen out of my dogs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I can, I can attest to that heritage, mm -hmm. but they're just a little bit lower key in terms of energy, a little higher key in terms of noise that mm -hmm. comes out of them. The toller scream, if you've never heard that, you can Google <laughs> that. That's a really interesting thing. Yes. <laughs> Shannon, what you mentioned- Turn your volume up. You mentioned about the uh, intelligence of a Border Collie. Yeah. What, do you think a super smart dog makes a better yeah. pet than a breed that's maybe not so swift? That is an amazing question and I love it. And I'm so glad you brought that <laughs> up. So I personally am of the mindset that not everybody wants a super intelligent breed. And I think that this is sort of like an entry level dog thing versus an experienced dog person mm -hmm. thing. Because once you have some experience with dogs, you can use that intelligence to your advantage. And right. that is an absolutely wonderful thing to be able to do because you know you have some like proactive ideas in mm -hmm. your head, right? You know what you're going to expect from that dog. You know how to channel the intelligence and channel the energy and teach them how to use the intelligence right. in a better way so that it is working for you rather than against you. But if you're at an entry level point with dogs, getting one of these dogs that is so intelligent that they often will end up using that intelligence to be more self-serving and yes. maybe naughty for lack of a better right. word. One at of this my point. parents, Border Collies, 
figured out that it's the alarm clock that makes my parents get up in the morning. Okay. So he would go over and just start whacking the alarm clock <gasps> well before it would go off. And my parents ended up having to put the alarm clock out of reach. <laughs> that is Because the such... dog, yeah, the dog would wake up at six and go, I'm ready for everyone to get up. That little box makes them get up. Whack. Oh Whack. my gosh. And that uh, is delightfully horrendous. Right. <laughs> And that's a, that's a smart dog, and that's oh, that is that's so the smart. games they come up yeah. with. Yes, absolutely. Mm. I thought you were going to say whacked it when the when the noise started happening. No, but no, that's well, even be, better. Whenever he woke up, he decided that time to get up. Everyone, smack! Oh my goodness! <laughs> oh my goodness! That box that's makes everyone wake up. Oh, so this is it's an interesting point because dogs are always looking for the value in situations. So when we move fast enough to present them with that value and help channel mm -hmm. their understanding of how to get that value, we can create brilliant, brilliant creatures. But when we are still sort of learning as we're coming along mm -hmm. and we're learning, this is this is the thing with dogs. You know, when you when you go to learn how to ride horses, for example, they don't put you on a green horse that's never no. been ridden. Or on a wild stallion. No, they put you on like <laughs> the old school horse that is predictable and calm yeah, and a kind animal. Yes. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Whereas when we get our dogs, we're jumping into the deep end of the pool without any sort of life right? preserver. Yes. You know, we're, yes. we're learning as we're teaching our dogs. Mm -hmm. So that's something to consider. And if there's these holes in timing, a lot of the times those really smart dogs can just whip up ideas right. of how to fill in those gaps. Right. Yes. So that is such an important thing. I'm so glad you brought that mm -hmm. up. The intelligence factor right. is so just, yeah, just incredible. Because you read like, oh, well, poodles are super smart or border yes. collies are super smart. Doesn't mean they're going to make a better pet for your family. Yeah. It means they might make a more devious pet and a dog that you have to be on top of and aware of the environment far yes. more carefully than a dog that's a little bit more dopey, I'll say. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is something that would be good, good information to tap into with a breeder mm -hmm. because a good breeder will be able to tell you, you know what, I don't think that you're going to have a good time with this dog because of this, 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 and this, mm -hmm. or yeah, I think you're a perfect home to raise this dog because of this, 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 and this. So right. yes. all of those things. Right. Oh, and the popularity now of uh, breeds like bulldogs and French bulldogs. The French bulldog has shot up in popularity yes. and to there is such health extreme. issues yes. with that breed. So yeah. be very, very careful because a lot of unscrupulous breeders have hopped on. Yeah, and um, and be aware too that those those bully type breeds often snore at night. <laughs> it's true. They often have a lot of flatulence. Yes, they their their wrinkles in their face get gunk in them, and you have to clean it out, or yeah. they get dermatitis in those wrinkles. Like yeah. there's, there's a little bit of grossness sometimes. There can be, yeah. absolutely. And with any of the brachiocephalic breeds or the breeds that don't have as long an airway passage, there are specific health issues and considerations to look into as well. So that's something to consider. Mm -hmm. it, you know, uh, like a Boston um, Terrier, for example, right. they are athletic little dogs, but they're not going to be very heat tolerant. Right. So like yes. if you like to get out and about and go for 20 mile hikes on the weekend. In the well, summer, yeah. Yeah, you're probably not going to be able to do that safely with most Boston Terriers. Mm -hmm. You know, like that, those are things to consider as well. French bulldogs are, are along the same right, vein. Yeah. Like there are these stocky little things that can have trouble breathing and you need to be very aware and very right, careful yes. with that so that they don't overheat or mm -hmm. exhaust themselves, right. etc. cetera. So. Yeah, because some will play and play and play until yeah. they, they drop dead, basically. We, um, when I worked at the emergency vet clinic in the summer, we ha would always have a lot of bulldogs oh come in goodness. with, with heat stroke. Uh, you know, people would bring them to the beach. Like, why would you bring a bulldog to the beach? That's not a breed for the beach. Yeah. Like it's... And of course, you know, some of the dogs passed away. Oh my goodness. And uh, so think of these when you get these yeah. breeds, yes. Yeah, get something that's going to match your lifestyle. And on that note as well, you were starting to talk about the um, some of the unscrupulous things that can happen in the dog market. Uh, it is an opportunistic market. I yes. mean, that that's the thing. It's very sad to have to say, but in any... Any situation where there is a potential for money to be made, there mm -hmm. are people out there who are willing to exploit that situation. Yes. So, if you are looking for one of these um, one of these rare breeds, uh, you're probably fairly safe because there's not going to be a lot of people looking to exploit that market because there's not a lot of of drive right. in that market. Yes. But if you're yes. looking for a doodle, for example, or a French bulldog because the popularity mm -hmm. has gone through the roof, you need to recognize that there's 
there's people waiting on the sidelines going, where am yes. I going to make my next uh, and gold and golden retrievers amount of money? Yeah. As well, because we see some real variances lately in golden yes, temperaments. We do. Yes. And we've actually, um, I would say about seven or eight years ago, maybe a little bit longer ago, we started seeing an increase in the possession issues that were coming right. along with golden retrievers. Mm -hmm. um, so something to keep in mind, you know, asking breeders about what they're doing to combat that issue and making sure that, you know, you feel that they're the parents that are being bred are safe, et cetera, and they're not passing along these traits that right. are yes. being bred back into the dogs accidentally mm -hmm. through, you know, just overbreeding, et cetera. Right. So, well, I, I had an interesting phone call once a lady called and um the neighbor down the street had bred um i can't remember what they were but they were like big like american bulldog type breeds okay and he had puppies and she's th we're thinking about getting a puppy and um i said well what are the parents like and she said well she goes we've seen them in their backyard and in okay. the backyard they seem pretty good and i said have you asked the owner what happens when he takes them out of the backyard mm -hmm. And so she, I, I said, you know what, can they handle walking, you know, past a grocery store? Can they handle a, a busy downtown street? And uh, she said, I don't know. I've never seen him walk them. I'll ask him. Uh. Well, it turns out he can't walk them because they're both very aggressive. Oh, dear. You know, not nice dogs at all. But to meet them in the backyard, yeah, they're fine. But take them out of that, put a little bit of pressure on them, and the dogs, you know, weren't a family dog temperament yeah so she uh, called back and, and she was very thankful she said you know what just seeing them they looked great but hearing that he can't handle them out of the yard she goes that you know that made our choice for yeah. us because we want a dog that can go to our kids baseball games absolutely you know, we, you know we want a dog that we can take to the campground with us yes oh so it's yeah yeah and this is an important thing i'm so glad that you brought this up because it is crucial that you see them outside of their home base to really be able to evaluate what they're like. You know, just like us, when I'm at home, mm -hmm. I'm pretty darn chill because this is my space. I'm used to this space. I'm not feeling, I don't feel threatened in right. my space at all. So mm -hmm. and why would I? Because I'm used to this space. Yeah. But when I get out to a big concert, for example, and I'm in a crowded space with lots of people around me, I would say my temperament changes quite a bit. Right. In you that go situation. crazy and insane. I do. I just start around. throwing punches <laughs> left and right. No. <laughs> no, I've been with Shannon at concerts and actually she's quite well behaved. Quite well behaved. Oh my God. Few woohoos here and there, but <laughs> <laughs> few arms. <laughs> yeah. it, that, this, so back to the point. It is definitely, <laughs> definitely good advice. Very yes. sage advice from our Swanee here to make sure that you get the parents out and about and see them somewhere else. Which is why shows are a good, right. Dog shows a good are example good. because you're seeing them outside of their home already, mm -hmm. and you're going to be able to see if there's some shyness there. And you know, maybe that is a breed that right. is known for shyness, and it's expected, and it's not a big, uh, it's not a big concern mm -hmm. but maybe it's a breed like a golden retriever that's showing shyness and that's a little bit mm, mm. i'm not so sure that i want to go down right, that road yes so. yes honda i got from a breeder who um just bred one litter okay of chinese cresteds and i ran it was just a chance meeting i was at the uh, vet clinic and mm -hmm. we ran into her and she was getting the puppies checked out by the vet okay and my son fell in love with them uh. and um i thought yeah well you know what? We are looking for a little kind of non-shedding breed right now. So I, I thought, hmm. So I got her information from her because uh, one of the puppies was available, little Honda. And Aww. we, um, his name was Romeo at the time. And uh, when I went in for my appointment, um, I asked about that breeder, uh, that lady. I said, "How? what are her dogs like? You know, that, you know what, what do you think? I'm thinking about getting one of those puppies. What do you think? So talking to that breeder's veterinarian yeah. too can be, give you a good source. Absolutely. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, um, and then I, I talked to her more and I found out that the, she was being mentored by a long time breeder. I looked at the bloodline. It was, uh, you know, a good solid bloodline and uh, did a bit more research and we decided to get Honda. So, uh, yeah. Amazing. So yeah, there are little, you know, there are yeah. people too out there who, you know, just breeding one litter, but, uh, you know, they've done all that, you know, they don't yes. have to be a big accredited breeder, no. you know, as, as long as they're doing their research and, yes. you know, and socializing and really doing well by the puppies. Yeah, absolutely. And getting them started well. And, you know, all of those things are mm -hmm. so important. And I love that story. I love that Honda was just sort of a chance meeting. He was I didn't just know a that. Yeah. He was just Aww. a chance meeting. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, our, our, the vet said, you know, no, she brings the dogs in the dogs are nice she you know she doesn't hesitate if the dogs need 
you know, something done. Good. Yep. We're going to do it. We're not going to, well, let's wait and see. No, she's like, no, let's get it done. Yeah. And you can definitely like, you can ask the breeder, Hey, can I get a referral? Right. Like, can you, can you, um, direct me to your vet? I'd just like to ask some questions and can you direct me to two or three of your puppy buyers who, who might, you know, Mm -hmm. two or three, just so that you have the volume and you can connect with one, hopefully at least. But a good breeder will be willing to share some sort of a referral or be willing to introduce you to some of their puppy owners at a show or, you know. Right. Yeah. Or their obedience instructor. Yes. You know, you could say, you know, well, where have you trained your dogs? And then, you know. You know, even come out, if they're in a class, come out and watch them with their dog yes. in a class. That would be a great thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. And then if you are visiting with the breeder or something similar and you get that tingling little spidey sense that says, mm-hmm. this seems odd. If it seems odd, ask. You know, ask, right, yeah. why is this thing like this? And then if you don't like the explanation, that gives you really good information right. to go on about whether or not this is the right breeder for yes. you to go with. So one thing I don't like that I see, I see this on Facebook a lot or, um, you know, uh, Kijiji and things like that. People, breeders allow somebody to pick their puppy at like one week old. Oh, yeah. And basically you're just picking a blob then. Yes. And, and what happens if that puppy has the complete wrong temperament? Yeah. I, I know when I, when I went to get a cowboy, my Saluki, I looked at all the puppies in the litter. I had second pick and I, I brought each puppy individually with me into a room. Okay. So they didn't have the influence of the other ones. Perfect. And, uh, the puppy that the breeder thought I was going to pick, I did not like that puppy. It was an extremely independent puppy. I brought him into the room, plopped him down. The first thing he did was left me. He just Uh left. He walked away. Wasn't interested. He was very independent and he was more interested in exploring and smelling shoes and looking at stuff than interacting with me. Uh I could not get that puppy's attention. Interesting. Okay. I brought Cowboy in, plopped her down and Cowboy's like, Hello, Christine. What are we going to do? Can I sit in your lap and lick your face? And I'm like, oh, I love this puppy. She wanted, like, she wanted to interact with people. Whereas that other puppy, you know, I'm sure he's a wonderful dog, but he wasn't, I would have had to really work hard with that extra hard. Yeah. With already with a breed that you knew you were going to have to put in. That are quite independent. Yes. Yes. So it's funny. The breeder thought, oh, I I thought you would want that puppy because he's very independent and bold. Hmm. And I said, no, I don't want the independent, bold puppy. I want the puppy that says, I love people and I love doing stuff and I like hanging out with you. So this is a good point too, because I wouldn't hesitate to let the breeder have the majority of the say in which puppy was coming Mm -hmm. home with me because I think that they know the puppies best. Right. But I want to make sure that they have that say based on what they what I actually want. Right. So this is a really good thing. Like talking to the breeder beforehand, before any picking happens, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes you won't have the option to pick. Sometimes mm-hmm. breeders will just pick for you. And, right. and sometimes that is that by is far the, best, the yes. better decision to be made. They know again, the puppies. They so know the well. puppies best. They know the breeds best. Right. And they, they, they hopefully have gotten yes. to know you so that they can make those matches. And it's not just a match mm-hmm. based on color or something of that right. nature. It's actually based on, you know, okay, this person here really seems to want an outgoing puppy and and this is the most outgoing puppy. This person here, I think, needs a softer puppy because they're maybe not going to be as right. good about follow through and making mm-hmm. sure the dog follows rules. And I want them to have a wonderful relationship. So I'm going to go with this puppy for that person because this puppy is not as likely to push the envelope and, you know, try to right. roll yes. the roost as this puppy over here. Mm. So there are really important things there. But it's really important that you let the breeder know what you're looking for. Like be honest, say, you know what? I want something that's going to be really chill through the week because I work long Mm -hmm. hours and I work hard. And Mm -hmm. by the time I get home from work, I just want a snuggle buddy. And, but we do want, you know, on the weekends we go for walks and we go for hikes and I want a dog that's going to be able to keep up with that. So I'll do this, 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 and this. And this is what I like in terms of temperament. I Mm -hmm. like a really snuggly dog. I like a more independent Mm -hmm. dog. You know, you can give the breeder those little pieces of information about you and your personality and they're going to be able to help you match the right puppy they're also going to be able to help you understand whether or not their breed is going to be the right breed for you yes and color is immaterial oh it really is i when i got a saluki i wanted a feathered and i wanted one of the the grizzled patterned because they're very flashy Mm -hmm. well cowboy is smooth and she was plain old beige yes (laughs) 
<laughs> but she was the perfect but dog she, for you. I adored yeah. that dog. And if I had chosen, there was a like a, a gray grizzle, there was a red grizzle. If I had chosen one of them, I don't think I would have achieved and and been as happy. Yeah. So I'm glad I got the plain beige, you know, unfeathered puppy. She she was incredible. And I, I yeah, I miss that dog every day. Aww. So color is completely immaterial. It really is. I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. um, in tollers, often people are attracted to the flashier version of the toller, the more white the more on white, it, the more yes. flashy it is, mm -hmm. et cetera. And uh, I've always traditionally had very plain faced boys and I, you know, it never, it never even occurs to me to look at the markings at this point anymore, mm -hmm. as far as one of the determining factors in which dog I like. Right. And I actually try really hard not to let that influence me at all. Yes. And with Ned's litter in particular, Ned is this very rich red color and he was the darkest in his litter of, mm -hmm. there was nine puppies in his litter and he was the darkest of those puppies and uh it was really hard not to focus on him because of that distinct mm -hmm. difference right off the right off the hop but I just put that aside I thought you know what I'm not going to let that influence my decision and I had actually left it completely up to the breeder in this one because I'm in Ontario and she was in BC and I thought I'm not going to know these puppies at all right, yes. I trust her I mm -hmm. trust her rearing process and she's absolutely amazing but I won't get a chance to visit with these puppies so what what good is my say right, going yes. to be other than what I see in pictures and videos that might catch my eye right. you know I really haven't had a chance to visit with these puppies etc mm -hmm. and as it turns out Ned is the perfect match yes. for me I mean he he's, is. Yes. he's just he's right he's fabulous I mean he's the dog that can do no wrong of right. course yes yeah. <laughs> and will and, always be <laughs> and you, you want a breeder that yes. really watch their puppies I, I you know I hate to talk about puppy mills but uh those people don't pay attention to their no. puppies they have no idea the puppy's personalities no. and often you know you go somewhere and you go suddenly this is a puppy mill what am I doing yeah. and your gut is to rescue the puppy to get it out of the situation but that's the worst thing you can yeah. do because now you're encouraging them to breed more yes we have to walk away from puppy mills absolutely as hard as that is and yeah. as heartbreaking it is as it is to do that I could not agree with you more it just mm -hmm. makes the problem worse and yes. it just opens the door for another puppy to take that puppy's place and of course the breeding females are usually oh, the ones yes. that take the majority of the horrendous Ness right. and abuse in that situation right. so abuse yes. in terms of neglect is typically more the more the realm that you get into but it's mm -hmm. just yeah like they won't let you see the mother yes you know sometimes you can't see the father because it's it, you know it's a stud dog from far away yes but if they won't let you see other dogs they have and the mother or where the puppies are being raised yeah. or where the mother's being kept you know all your flags should go up yeah and at that point you you know it's hard but you got to say no because we got we have to end puppy mills and it yeah. has to it's, you know, we all have to band together. Absolutely. And that means education. It means being aware of what a good breeder looks like. You know, as you said, where is the puppy being raised right now? I can think of reasons for stock dogs to be bred and reared out in like a barn situation. Mm -hmm. But aside from that... I would expect my puppies to be raised in a breeder's home right. underfoot with the mm -hmm. kids, with the people, you know, like yes. with all sorts of activity going on because that's the life they're going to right. live. And it's exposing them to the noise of the house. Yeah. You know, they hear the furnace coming on. They hear yes. dishes clinking. They hear the toilet flushing. Yeah. The dog that's been raised in a barn, th those noises are going to, you know, possibly terrify it that first window of the puppy's world that first eight weeks of life it's an important it's an important time yes it really is crucial that those dogs get an opportunity to be started well mm -hmm. and you know some breeders will start them well in terms of early stimulation and all sorts of things like that and then they'll continue on as the puppies grow they'll make sure that they get experience and exposure outside of the home as well as mm -hmm. inside yes. they'll have like little agility setups and all right, sorts yeah. of interactive toys that you know the puppy's got to go underneath sort of like the old car washes yep. with the things dangling down and mm -hmm. the car went through and then these like um cloth yep. uh agitators <laughs> would i don't i have no it's quite idea. a description i have no idea what you would call any <laughs> of these things and it's been so long since i've been through a car wash but like all well, of I those go through the car wash every week do you well, that's really because i live 
I parked my car under a tree uh, and it's the bird's favorite tree. Uh, and it's not regular birds. It's pterodactyls. Uh, I have a self-cleaning car. Oh. <laughs> it takes care of itself. <laughs> when I'm sleeping, it cleans itself. I need so one I don't of have them. to worry about it. I need one of them. And then <laughs> in the spring, I just roll all the windows down and all the taller hair just blows, blows out. out. Yeah, I've been behind you. It's blinding. I have to put my... <laughs> windshield wipers on <laughs> actually i typically a couple of times a year i'll go to like the rainbow car wash set up and pull out the big vacuum and do all that because otherwise i would literally just be a car that drove down the street that looked like it was a big brillo pad big, big orange brillo pad there would be no room so, to see the driver it's warm in there in the winter though yeah <laughs> that's a fact anyways i digress i can't remember what we were talking about before we got onto car washing i think we're saying something about dogs oh yeah so the um the setups the toys and what yeah something right, about yes. dogs um the toys like where where these toys will dangle and they'll mm. have to push through and they'll get used to all sorts of right. weird stimuli and then they'll introduce crates and they'll introduce like yes. you know there's yes. so many things that they can help with in those first mm. eight weeks of life to right. make sure the puppies get off to a good start even right. before eyes and ears are open there's th there are things that you can do for early neurological stimulation that, that make a big difference mm -hmm. with right, a lot of yes. puppies yeah and once uh, you know they're a little bit older having visitors come to visit them yes. having uh, you know people with children who are well behaved come to visit them so the puppies learn that some people wear hats yeah some little kids run around and scream yes. you know people have different color skin yeah, mm. absolutely. All those things and the noises and the smells, et cetera, mm. et cetera. I would make sure I had some smelly people over too. Oh, well, I'm inviting you, <laughs> Shannon, for sure. <laughs> I'm there. All right. This has been a fun episode. So I hope that it has been educational for everybody. If you have questions, leave them in the comment section below yes. and we will shape some future podcasts based on your questions. Mm. We would be thrilled to be able to answer your questions and help you in your dog journey. And on that note, I'm Instructor Shannon. Instructor Swanee. Happy training. The McCann Dogs Podcast is brought to you by McCann Professional Dog Trainers. We help dog owners to have a well-behaved, four-legged family member. Please give us a call at 905-659-1888 or visit us at mccanndogs.com. Happy training.